Hey, good morning. This is Bourne, Saturday the 4th or 5th of March, uh, maybe the 6th. I don't keep track that much, but um, anyway, uh, it is Saturday. Um, I'm going to throw, and I have been throwing, some large urns, and I haven't done large pieces for a while, so I thought I would do this, and um, so it's not, not something really for beginners, but um, I will talk through it as if it was for a beginner. All right, so, um, and I'm going to throw tall urns. All right, let's see. I was wrong. This is five pounds of clay. Now make sure you don't have any air bubbles. If you're recycling clay, you've got to check it really carefully. I don't have a de-airing pug mill, it's just regular. So make sure on a big piece of clay that you got something fairly rounded to, to start centering. I don't have my wall next to me, so I have to press a bit harder on these. So the first thing you got to do is really stop it from having any bumps. So just kind of apply some pressure and just try and smooth out all those little bumps that are coming up. So you've got a fairly smooth surface right to the bat so you don't have any folds that are going to lock any air in it and then keep coning it to see if you can get a little bit taller because because it's recycled it's probably not fully it's probably got some air in it and i don't think it the other ones didn't have any inconsistencies so i think this is fine and then squish it down let it go slowly and get some water to finish that. Now the left hand is locked in right on the wheel head and on the splash pan so that I can make sure that the side is not doing any kind of rippling. And my right hand is giving myself quite a flat top. And that's it. That's about as centered as I need it. It's a good idea to just flatten the wall a little bit just there so it isn't bulging out. Put some water on because I this is a heavy piece to put. I put one finger on top of the other to press down. It's stronger than one finger and helps so you don't dislocate your finger to press so hard. I have actually hurt my finger sometimes, so you've got to be careful when you're putting a lot of pressure on, you don't hurt your hand. Then check to make sure you're not too far down or too, or too thick. This is about right, so I'm just feeling the bottom at this point, just to kind of make sure there's no rocks or anything because it's recycled clay. Lumps of salt get in my recycled clay. Okay, so it's fairly good. I'm going to press in just a touch under at the bottom there. So I've got like a little groove right at the bottom, because then I can get these fingers underneath that. And then for the first pull, I'm going to use my knuckle, and it'll dry fast when you're doing a big pot like that. So get your hand nice and wet, and go for it straight away and come up fairly quickly because the clay is drying it's a big area to have scraping on the surface let go slowly see it's dry so that's why i use fingertips instead of knuckles because the knuckles will actually seriously but your knuckle gives you a lot more power so it's good to use your knuckle at first It's that whole scraping of the surface, and so you've got to get up there fairly quickly. Now I'm going to slow the wheel down a touch. Now I'm going to use my fingertips. Press in, but it's drying out straight away. So I'm not going to do a pull at that point. I was just narrowing the form at the bottom. Same again. Dig in deep, but this time I'm going to do a pull. So the inside fingers are higher up. 
than the outside fingers, so that will help control the width of the piece. Because the last thing to touch the clay as I go through the wall is my bottom fingers on the outside. I just felt a rock. You can dig them out. It's easy. See how it stayed narrow? Because my and now I'm going to pull my thumb on my right hand, my left hand, to narrow it a bit more again at the top. All right. See where I felt that rock? Yeah, I can't feel it now. It's somewhere in the top area, so it won't be too bad. So now dribble your water on the very rim, so it's all the way around. Now I'm going to stand up for this and slow the wheel down a touch. Dig your fingers deep at the bottom on the outside and start a pull before it dries out. Now that my left arm is not resting on the rim at the top, because sometimes your arm can actually rest on the rim and make it wider. So I've got my hand directly going down into the piece, my left hand, so it's not actually making the piece get wider. And see, you can keep it narrow. Be, be aware of that left hand so it doesn't stretch out. There's the lump. So you're trying not to widen it at the top. And I'm not doing a real thinning pull at the top here. I want to leave it a little thicker. Oh, there are two stones. I just felt another one. Yeah, it's hard because when you're wearing shoes in the winter, you're dragging bits of salt in the studio. <laughs> so I have two sets of stu shoes, studio as well as outdoor shoes, which still gets, comes in. I'll dig it out when it gets a bit thinner. Dribble right on the rim. So it goes all the way in and out. Then wet your arm too because it'll catch your arm if it, your left arm needs to be wet a little bit. Same again, do another pull just like the last one. Be aware of your left arm so it doesn't push the rim any wider. And try and keep your left hand as narrow as possible down there. You see I was resting on the rim then, I noticed myself. It's easy to forget. It's an intense concentration. So it is very easy to suddenly realize your hand is doing something you didn't want it to do. But keep it off the rim. There's the stone. I think it might have just come out onto my finger. There's another one there. Oh, and now I'm feeling a third, because it's the wall is getting thinner now. There's the, that's the bigger one in the top area there. But I thought I felt the only bad ones, but let's see. So, top, if you get too wide, just use your fingers like that and collar it in a bit, but not too much because you've got to get your arm down there again. If you've got fat arms like I do, then basically you've got to leave it fairly big. So I'm putting water all the way down again, right on the rim, so it's inside and out. And I'm going to slow it down to a really fairly slow speed at this point, because this will be my last big pull. So starting at the bottom, not right at the very bottom, because I, I actually put these pieces outside um, on my, my disability ramp. Um, I decorate it in the summer, you'll see from the pictures, um, there's a ramp on the side of my building. And I decorate that with flower pots and large urn type jars. So I leave a big piece of clay at the bottom where I can put screw holes through okay so I'm not doing too much more at this point because I'll start using the rib in a minute 
I don't need to thin it here. I'm just widening it. So I'm pressing with my outside hand, with my inside hand. That's where all the lumps were in the hole and a big piece of grit. Once I use the rib, it will smooth it all out. Now it's a little thicker up at the top area here. So I can do a little pressure to get a bit more height. And that's it. Up to the top. And now I'm going to use, I need to get all the water out basically. So a sponge on a stick. I can still reach the bottom with my hand, but it's a bit safer with a sponge on a stick. There was quite a bit of water down there. And then what I do is I put my sponge at the bottom and I drag it from the bottom to the top to try and get rid of any dry spot or any wet spot and make it really even all the way up so that there shouldn't be a dry spot or a wet spot when I put my hand down in there again and push it against the edge of the rib because that could actually make it go off center. Okay, so we've got it nice and even all the way up on the inside. I'll get my hand a little cleaner. So now I use the rib and I'm going to start about an inch from the bottom. I press in with the rib to narrow the bottom. Now I'm going to pull up, up, pull it all the way to the top. And I'm just trying to get a gentle, smooth curve without dragging too much clay off the surface on the outside. I'm simply pushing against the edge of the rib and the rib is giving way so it gets wider. But the rib is always in contact with the clay so it keeps it smooth. And there's all those lumps of rocks. You'll definitely feel them with the rib when you come up. Not that too much. Same again, I'm gonna try and squish out a bit further Obviously, it's very thin in the top. This is five pounds of clay, remember. Yeah, it's really sunny in Nova Scotia this morning. I stopped looking at the weather. It's been so weird recently. It's snow and then sunny and the snow all melts and then we get another snowstorm. Okay, if you get any wobble, that means you're done. So as long as I don't get any kind of terrific wobble in the piece, I'll keep bellying it. This is where it's the thinnest, right there. Push in with the edge of the rib at the top to make a, a shoulder. And then pull the rib down. I want that curve to stay gentle. Not bad. And then the top. So, okay, it's a bit moist on the top on the inside, but I'm going to get a little water on my fingers and put them down just over the edge on the inside so I can do a little squish and pull. Not really a pull, but just a, a squash to try and flatten the top. So you don't want to drag at all with your fingers. Otherwise you can pull that wall is so thin underneath there. And my middle finger is pressing in and my middle finger on the inside is pressing back. So I can press it down, but also make it stretch in a bit narrower. And what I'm aiming for, let's get my calipers, is a lid sized like that. 
So if we get it in, that's good. So I'm going to do the same again. I push my finger, middle finger on the inside with my little finger on the out and push towards the center and try and narrow it just a touch more. But pushing it down so as narrowing, I can also flatten it a little bit. So you should never move on the same level of, you know, as it goes around twice, it'll get dry. So try and be a little further in each time or up the wall, whichever. So you only stay on one level, one rotation. And then I think I must be close now. So let's put the rib in to flatten the top completely. And I'm gonna push down left where the rim is. I'm gonna press hard with my finger on the inside pushing back to get myself a little height just at that point there. Lifts the lid just a touch. Same again. And try and get a bit more height this time. And that's all I need, I think. Take a look at it. I've got a couple of pit holes from the rip pebbles to fill in. And there, there's a couple of air bubbles too. So I'm just wetting the sponge, get the slip that's left on the top off. And push in with my fingernail now, just right opposite my middle finger that's on the inside, and press together to get some extra height. And once I've done that, it should be even, except for it will actually need a little pinning. Take a deep breath when you do this, and don't wander up and down. And you lift it right off. So that your lid will sit flat. Sometimes a bit will fall on the inside. Hold your pin just on the inside, and it will pull out any bit that fell in. This recycled clay, I've done a video really early last year, about, you know, in the spring maybe last year, I did a video on recycling clay. So, because I don't waste clay, it is a lot of work, but these pieces are all done with clay that I actually, some studios throw their clay away instead of recycling it. We pay a lot for clay in Nova Scotia, because it has to be shipped here. Um, there's no manufacturer here, so, so I don't throw it out. Okay, so I make a groove at the bottom with my favorite rib, which you can see. Oh, and somebody was asking about the little rim tool that I get. I use, I made my own, but Freddie Moretti is one of my subscribers, and he actually has a program for a 3D printer. If somebody wants it, they'll have to look for Freddie in my subscriptions. And, and I email him, and then hopefully he'll send you the program. He worked hard on that to produce that program for a 3D printer. There you go. And that was a tool I designed myself, but um, instead of using a leather, which I'm always losing, in fact, I don't know where my leather is. I have one, and it's somewhere in one of these wheels. But that other tool is bright red. You've seen it in my other videos. So I never lose that. All right. I guess that's a too narrow for a cookie jar. I've made some of these that will be cookie jars. Um, and I've got some of them that are just decorative type urns, um, which um, you can put things in if you want to. Let's see if I can steady this. Oh, okay, not high enough yet. All right, so that's step one. Decorating it and trimming it will be next. Thanks. Okay, these are the lids. So let's put you down again, a bit closer because you can get as close to this as you want. They're very small. This is about three quarters of a pound of clay. So really seal it down. Alright, 
These are the lids where you have a deep flange and the knob will be on the bottom. So put your fingers down. Don't go too far down because you want it to be fairly thick if you're going to throw a knob on the top when it's on the trimming wheel. That's when I put my knobs on. Little finger. Well, you can use a middle finger if you want to. I've just always done my little finger. Press in. Get some water on there. So you've got a flange. Now you're just going to lift that to a very tall flange. I put these outside, so I like a deep flange. So that the lid doesn't blow off in the hurricane. I screw the pot down, but the lid is just loose on the top. So I want to make sure that flange is fairly deep. And then I'm going to measure it. To let you see. Oh, look at that. It is exact. So I like them to be up loose a little bit. So, so let's, if you've got it really tight, use your square off rib a little bit and press in with that flange. And make sure you've got, I like a, a, a quarter inch looseness up there because um, pots can warp a little bit in the kiln. Your glaze has thickness when you put that on. Um, so you want to make sure that you've got a quarter inch clay when you're throwing like this. And you can always change it a little bit when you're trimming. Now let's have a look again. This should go down easily this time. Yep. It's absolutely the right size at the bottom there. Um, so I think I could probably push that in again. The top is perfect. So it's obviously getting wider. So just using your rib, I just push in at the bottom there. And that narrows it just a touch. And you've got a very wide top there. So... And I sometimes do this too, if you've got one of these ribs. I made the, the, um, one of these ribs from a new one, so I've got a different one as well. But this is my old one that's 30 years old. Okay, so I angle it like that and just push. And you can give your lid some height. straighten it up a bit but I lifted that lid a good one two centimeters maybe an inch I'll show you see I lifted it up quite a bit and that's the lid next we have to trim the lids which have been left overnight so I'm using the giffing grip if you're just using a regular wheel, you can actually just fasten them down with lumps of clay. Um, they're very heavy and very thick. Let me make sure that's sitting properly. Yep. So the first thing I do, there's lots of ways of trimming a lid, of course. You can have a flat lid, you can have a curved lid, you can have a lid with lots of different kind of shoulders. But I'm just going to have one shoulder. Starting there, I'm going to trim deep. And I, I threw these very thick for this purpose. They're also going outside these pieces, so they have to be a little heavy. And then give that shoulder and then curve it over. And then just define that edge a bit more. I may do a little fluting on that very edge there. That's it. I have a bunch of these pots made, probably about 12 to 15 large jars, which I'm just going to spend the whole day today making little lids for, and I've decided to do them all in birds, uh, although I might get bored and I might make a couple of whales, but let's see. Anyway, here we go. This is how I make the bird to attach to the lid of the jar. I've got one here. 
that I already made. I'm just letting it dry out a little bit just to speed things up a little bit. The slab of clay rolled at about um, less than a quarter, maybe an eighth of an inch to a quarter of an inch in that region. I have a little sausage of clay. And um, what I do with that is I try to estimate just with the size of it. You can see it's thicker than a finger and, um, and I'm just narrowing the ends down a little bit. It may be too much clay here. So then I bend up the coil and I've got like a, a primitive seal and I'm just going to sculpt pulling down the clay where I think there needs to be some thicker and then pull down the head it's still way too big but it's better to start with more clay than too little so it's just a coil a little fat coil thicker than my finger and I'm now just spending time basically pinching smudging until I feel like I've got what looks like a bird shape the belly of the bird and the chest of the bird you just have to kind of keep pinching till you've got the basic shape birds have a kind of a it's not a huge head, but it continues from the body. It's not like they have a neck. And you can get photographs, obviously. But you can see it's starting to take shape. I always like birds to look proud. So I tend to pull their beak up a little bit rather than down. And that's the basic shape, but the tail is too thick. So I'm going to pull that out. I may pinch some of this off, depending on how much I've got there. And of course, some birds have long tails, others have short, fat tails. So pretty much everything is just squishing and smudging until you think you've got the shape. And take have a few photographs. I've got it in my head, so I don't need to get photos. But if you're not sure what a bird looks like, just get some photos around you. My iPad is covered in clay from all the research that I do in the studio on it. I've, uh, my one is broken, as I said earlier. Now I've got another one. But So there's the tail. It's not out of line. I'm not sure whether to leave that, that big. I'll tidy it up a little bit, but I think it's not too bad. So maybe I started with just the right amount of clay. Okay, so we've got a bird shape. Sit in there. I cut out a slab, roll out a slab, and I just have to estimate with the wings, and I've done one already. Now clay, when it's thin, doesn't like to be bent, so don't keep bending these wings backwards and forwards, otherwise it will actually, the clay will snap, so I support it as I lay it down, because I've already done one, so I can kind of get an idea of the shape just by drawing around that one. And this bird I just made is almost the same size, maybe a little bigger. I'm just giving a little scratch where I've got the other one to kind of give myself an idea of how big it's got to be. And then support it when you do it. You can cut a paper stencil if you want to, to do this part. So you've already drawn it out. And I have a basic wing shape. Now it's easier to do work on it at this point than actually doing it lines. You know, it might be nice to kind of do some lines, but I'm probably going to smudge these out. I may carve them in later on afterwards. It'll give an indication of the feather structure, but I tend to carve into them later on anyway. Okay, can we still see everything? Okay, so I have my bird. This clay is pretty soft, as you just saw, I modeled it, so I just need to dampen the surface a little bit, scrub in a little bit. And then you can do a little bit to the bird itself. But that's pretty soft. Let's see how I can do this so you can see it. Is that good? Place him down. Just make sure it looks fairly even. 
I think that'll be a good even one. Okay, so I'm going to lift it up to do it because I want to see what I'm doing myself. But the clay will snap if it bends. So, and now I'm just moving my thumb and holding the body and just moving it around till I feel like it stops slithering and then it's stuck. Now, if you thin the clay too much, it will, the, the wings will just flop right off and crack. So you've got to kind of smudge in without thinning too much. And when the clay is firmer, you can actually go over it with a modeling tool and carve some detail in. Now underneath there, I'm going to pull from the body of the bird up into that under, can you see this? Yep. Um, pull the clay up from the body into the join. Don't pull it from the wing into the join because that will thin the wing. Um, so you've got enough clay in the body to do this part and that will give it some extra strength. This is that recycled clay as well. So it, it's losing its plasticity as I recycle it over and over again, obviously. Every time I trim and recycle clay that goes into the slot bucket. So that clay becomes two, twice recycled. If not, I've got some clay here, probably three, four, five times recycled. Every time you recycle, the clay seems to leave a lose a little bit of its uh, plasticity. So uh, I have heard, and I've never done it yet, you can add ball clay to your recycled clay and that'll give it back some plasticity. It also changes the composition of your clay body. But, um, but this is still working as we go, so it's done there. So we have a bird with wings. Um, I've got the lids here, um, and I like, as I said, my birds, when I'm putting them on, I like them to look proud. We raised chickens for a long time, and, um, and uh, we basically got the eggs from them, and we had to give too many eggs away. When we moved to Canada from the States, we couldn't bring them with us, so I found a vegan vegetarian to take them. <laughs> All right, so now I've got to be very careful. The wings are going to bend if I'm not careful. Now the clay is very soft, so I don't have to worry about it sticking. I've scored and scratched underneath where the lid is. I'm going to make sure this is in the center of the lid. Carving into the breast of the bird. All right, that's how I make a bird. All right. With the giffing grip, it's pretty easy. You just have to be careful. Um, and because um, the handles are obviously going to get knocked off very easily. This is leather hard now. Um, so that you see that the tallest arms that come with this thing are just about perfect. One thing I do recommend is if you have, I've told before in other videos, this is yoga mat. So I can place that underneath, make sure I don't chip the rim while I'm actually trimming these. So that just supports the rim above the, the wheel itself. Let's turn the wheel off. See how centered it is. That's pretty good. Um, so basically, tall pieces like this, a giffing grip is really useful. Um, and I just, I threw these fairly thick. Yeah, there's a little wobble there, I think, which isn't bad on a large piece like this. Remember, I'm actually... And that's it. So when I'm doing a hole, that's why I made that little foot. So I can put this right there and just drill through. And I do three of them. It's very neat. So basically, if somebody decides not to put this outdoors, they don't have to worry about it.
hide the holes, which I don't think about unsightly anyway. Once you glaze it, you probably won't see them much. I also put wax inside there before I glaze to make sure no, no glaze sticks inside those holes. There we go. It doesn't weigh hardly anything. I really trimmed off a nice, nice amount there. And then put my bird on. And we have a nice decorative piece, either indoors or outdoors, whatever you want to do. This is done in my recycled clay, so I'm not expecting great things. I'll bisque fire this and I might have holes in it. There's something just there and there. These things will burn out in the firing, but it could be anything. But anyway, there you go. I've got 10 of these to do. I won't uh, keep you watching all of those. We'll show you the next step, which will be glazing, I guess. Alright, the uh, urns have been glazed and now fired um, and um, the glazing was pretty intense because they're also big um, so I didn't do part of that part of the video but uh, it's basically dipping uh, from top and bottom so I'm sure most people know how to do that if not just mention I could do some glazing videos but um, but anyway there's some planters that I took out on top of this kiln it's that time of the year, people are asking me for planters, so um, so I made some. I always have an outdoor display of planters, but here's the inside of the kiln. You can see the top of those urns. I took some out of a firing the other day, posted it at the end um, of a video, but these are the ones that I've got coming out today. They've been fired with the lids on, so live video, we'll see if I'm losing pieces from sticking. Uh, let's see what we have. And this firing schedule was, oh, wow, that's very pretty. This is Tenmaku Gold. Look how great that turned out. This is a glaze with variegated blue on the bottom. See how it started to run? I've talked about variegated blue running in the past. and um, But this only had a 15, 20 minute soak um, so it was a short soak um, and then a slow cool down to 1750 with another hour soak so that's why we have so much in you know that and now let's see there's my little chisel let's put you down a bit so you can see a bit more so the lid you have to hope, just using the chisel, it comes right off. There's, look how toasty brown that is, where the glaze was wiped off. This is recycled clay. It's actually a really sweet color this time. Um, but, um, but so fire with the lid on, that means I used wax when I was glazing. But that is a very pretty urn. And I put holes in the foot, as you can see, so I can screw these to my ramp so people can walk up my ramp to the studio. And, uh, oh, I can hear it tinking too. We've got some... This is a pasta jar. I always, here you go, let me tilt that down. Uh, spaghetti, that way I don't risk chipping it. The rubber handle just, you know, if you hit it with a metal edge, you might chip a little bit. So the rubber on the end of the pliers is perfect. So that's two, a success story again. That's my white on the inside. I don't think you can see properly with the light anyway, but. Oh, oh this one ran a little bit. See the way it ran to the edge down there? Oh, let's put the light on a better light. See, that one ran right to the bottom. Fortunately did not, I'll just have to grind it a little, little bit, but that's a oh, tight it's... fit too, so let's see. No, it's actually not overran. It's good to do that, and that one's perfect. Just have to thoroughly wax and wipe these. There's the lid. To Bluebird. 
Yeah, that's a very pretty one. I don't know. Oh. This one is my oatmeal with my apple green over the top, which always, I always think that gives a lot of bronze kind of greenish look too. It didn't run too much or at all. Let's have a look. This glaze is beautiful when it works really good. There you go. I, see how much I left at the bottom because of the uh, chance of running? Because I'm used to this glaze. Oh, you see? Yeah, okay. So, oh, this one's the one I fired the lid previously. Um, this one is on an old kiln shelf, and it's stuck to the kiln shelf a little bit, so uh, I did a half shelf in there. Probably shouldn't have done that because it knocked a little bit off the bottom. I'll have to grind it on the new shelves, the advances. That wouldn't have happened. This is bright blue out of Mastering Cone 6 glazes with my own dark blue, which is just twice as much cobalt. Uh, and then the oatmeal a little bit on the top. There we go. Um, this one, I wiped a lot off the bottom on this one because I know that this uh, copper glaze is a chance of running. It didn't run like the last one, ran down quite a bit. This one didn't. There you go. This is that uh, in Mastering Cone 6 glazes again. I, it's a metallic glaze, they call it at the end. It's not food safe. Um, but let's see if we can get the lid off times. It'll work. There you go. So, once again, my white liner on the inside. Nice bird on that one. I did a good job on the wings. Some of them I kind of make them look a little squat, I think. Uh, anyway, that's the next one. This one looks nice. This is with the tomato red. Oh, yes, that's very nice, yeah. This has got, we need some light on the color. So that's got the blue on the bottom, overlapping the brown. Tomato red, this is ketchup red, tomato red. Let's see if I can get this one off. This one looks like it tightened up a little bit. There we go. Oh, I see what I did. I did a double flange on that one. See it there, little thing? So it was sitting a little funny on the top. So it's fine now. But uh, yeah, the white, when the wax melted it, it moved it down a bit. There you go, so that's another one. I'll take pictures and put these all at the end of the video. And there's some greens. Oh, this one ran too. So, oh, look at that. It's the bronze that ran. Oh, so I guess the green and the bronze don't like each other. And I can grind that off because that glaze grinds really easy actually but the pot is intact because it lifted right off the shelf um, so the green doesn't like the bronze it runs a bit on the bottom there some glazes you know will just be more stable as they overlap but others you know will just run and this is my oh that's a nice I know this one always works out. And that's the tiger stripe we've talked about in previous recipes with the mouse brown and then the oatmeal over the top. So you can lift that one up. Yeah. So the wax worked really good with this recycled clay. I love the toasty brown quality of that recycled clay. It's got a little bit of earthenware mixed into it. So it gave it that toasty brown look. And this one I really like, this is that glaze that I've been playing with, with the, um, oh, that's very rich. This is the turquoise mat. I got it off Pinterest. And they also, I did seafoam off Pinterest and Val's turquoise. So I got three of these turquoise glazes. So that worked nice with the bird being a bronze. Let's see if he lifts off. Yep, easy. It's a tight fit lid, that one. That's about as tight as I could get it. There you go, Just give you an idea of size. Another pasta jar. 
There you go. I told you some people think I call these Minister Joe like pastor in a religious sort of way. And yeah, that really does the toasty brown quality. This is really nice. I'll probably run some wire wool over the clay a little bit later on and just smooth it because it's fairly smooth, but I think it needs a little kind of abrasion. Well, it's nice not to have coffee mugs in every firing, isn't it? Although these pieces as a, will sit around for a long time. There you go. So we've had a fairly successful grouping here. Um, some, some notes to be made about blazes that don't like, they run a little bit. Um, now I didn't do a video of these, but I just made a whole batch uh, pit, little pitchers, tiny little creamers, and I didn't do a video of it, but I noticed in my showroom I didn't have any creamers left, so that's a very pretty one. This is the comb pack, uh, 2205 with a 15 20 minute soak at 2205 down 125 degrees an hour to 1750 with another hour soak, and I took it up from 2000 to 2205 at 108 degrees Fahrenheit an hour. All right, 